everybody. Oh, wow, that's cool. Can you hear me? All right, cool. Let's, uh, and you can see me, right? Congressman, I'm Dennis Hagee, I'm president of Fleet Reserve Association Branch 50. And uh, you may know that there is a uh, VA CBOC co-located at Queens West uh, Hospital campus that uh, there's no announcement to that effect for any veterans who might be driving by. And uh, apparently there's no intention for uh, the VA to uh, announce that. So that just any veteran or any veteran's family, whether they're in trouble or not, if they have health care issues, uh, might find this a place to go to receive uh, care. So if I, if I heard you, and I'm sorry, the, the audio is not quite um, um, you know, the optimum, so I just want to make sure I understood you. So you're saying that there's a, there's a veteran's health care capacity at Queens West on a co-location basis. I know, okay, so I got that, but they're not, they're not providing any signage uh, for, for, for people or, or advertising for people to, to go there, and so veterans are not, I mean, they don't know what's available to them. Is that, is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. Now, there's plenty of signage, but it's on the back side of the hospital. So if they could just move the signs out to the street, then any veteran or anybody in any veteran's family, I mean, we per capita, we are number one in the nation. They will, uh, they will know this is possibly a place where they could go to receive treatment. Thank you. Okay. I think I understand. Um, I um, again, if if let let me find out. Um, I just I just don't know enough to respond to you right right off the top on on that on, on that issue. I mean, obviously there there should be full access and full publicity, and and um, I just I just need to look into it myself. So if you could, if if my staff could see you as well, that would be really helpful to me, and then we can um, kind of try to get an answer to you. And, and then if it's something that we need to communicate to the broader community, then we'll, we'll, we'll look for opportunities to do that. Okay. Thank you. I think the, you, the best you can do for us is to direct the local VA to move their signs from the back side of the hospital okay. to the street side of the hospital and the problem will be solved. Thank you very much, if you can do that. So, I, I just I don't know why, but I'm just I can't hear you uh, very well. It's not your it's not your fault. It's it's our it's our audio. I'm trying to figure out um, whether what I will do is um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do an uh, uh, let's try let's try one more person. And if it's still this way, I'm gonna do kind of an on the fly adjustment, and we're gonna we're gonna have uh, one of my staff hold up a phone as well to the microphone so I can hear it on my phone. Okay. Morning. My name is John. I don't know why, but I'm just getting a lot of feedback, and I, I, it's very, um, um, very vague. But let's let's try it. Nestor, can you talk and see see what's happening? Uh, test, test. Congressman, can you hear me on this mic? If not, we'll have Kira test on her mic. Kira, you have your mic. Test, test. One, two, three. Can you hear me, Ed? I'm sorry, did you say, go ahead, try it again. Test, test, one, two, three. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not even hearing you now. So, Kira, can you, can you call me? And um, if, if the gentleman could use the mic so that uh, the uh, folks can, can, um, okay, here we go. Sorry, sorry. Okay. If, as long as the gentleman, as long as that mic works so that everybody else can hear his question, um, I have my phone on, and if you could hold it up so that I could try to hear it from him too, okay? All right. Yes, my name is John, yes, can you hear me? Yes, much better. Could you expand on your comment concerning end of life at Tripler, specifically since we've got conflicts probably building out there in the Pacific? Thank you, sir. Um, well, I think Tripler is, what is it, 70 some odd years old now? Um, and the, the fact is that um, 
that's a long time for a, for a facility to be around. It's much longer than, than most, uh, and that, you know, that's a, as you know, that's one of our level four hospitals. It's, it's got just so many uh, capabilities. It serves such a broad audience. It's really critical uh, to, to, our, to our active military as well as our, our vets uh, in conjunction with Spark Matsunaga, which is obviously newer. But Tripler proper is uh, way old for a facility, and they we've and so um, it we need we need a Tripler. So we're not talking about not having a Tripler. Uh, we but we need to think about uh, what's what's the next generation of uh, Tripler, and so that's what we're trying to work through right now. Um, it, it from all indications we we've done studies of it. Um, not me personally, but uh, you know the government, and it's it's structurally pretty good for for a facility of its age. But the internal uh, side of it needs to be pretty much renovated and and fixed up, up to modern medicine. And so um, we're we're going through a pretty complicated analysis of okay, what do you do? Um, do you do you keep the structure itself and and then you know renovate the inside, or do you actually start over again? Uh, and do you master plan that facility a little bit different? Um, so that's that's the analysis that we're going. It's a tremendously expensive uh, project, whatever we do, but we have to do it because triplers. We're always going to have a need for tripler. And then I think you had a reference to, um, um, in relation to facilities elsewhere in the Pacific. If I if I think if I heard you correctly, was that right? No. I'm sorry. Are you still there, Kira? Sorry, we're still. I was just asking whether. I was I was asking him whether he he had a question about. Um, I thought I heard I heard him say, in relation to other facilities elsewhere in the Pacific. Is that was that the question? No, I'm sure that Tripler is still a conflict. Conflicts. Complex. Conflicts. Right. Okay, I think I think we got it. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Congressman, can you hear me? Yeah. My name is Michael Brazil. Uh, I'm 75 years old. I was stationed uh, at. at uh, on Ford Island in uh, the late 60s. Uh, ever since, my, my question is this, uh, it's comment and question. Ever since the uh, opioid debacle, um, legislators have really worked very hard to make it harder and harder uh, to, because of all the irresponsibility between uh, pharmaceutical companies, physicians, and prescribing and misprescribing. I'm here because uh, I've got enough hydrocodone in my system right now to be walking around and be comfortable enough to be walking around. But it was my own, uh, uh, if I didn't advocate for myself, my physicians were afraid to uh, prescribe. And I just wonder, I know that there are a lot of other people I've talked to who uh, the quality of their life is much better now because they, there are uh, drugs that quell their pain. I'm one of them. Is there any way to mitigate the crackdown that seems to be across the board of uh, people who are suffering? Like, uh, it, was, I, it was really, really difficult for me in the last couple of years after um, taking opioids responsibly to convince physicians that I can be responsible because of the nature of an irresponsible uh, uh, patients, a conglomeration of patients and physicians and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I, I know it's a hard one for you, but uh, it's really, the, the doctors are afraid to prescribe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a, a real dilemma to get right in Congress. Uh, we definitely did and 
still do have an opioid epidemic um, that has killed over 100,000 Americans. Um, and um, that number is staggering when you think about it, um, that um, that level of overdose um, out there, uh, that level of, um, uh, you know, uh, tragedy um, demanded a lot of action. And the action was uh, in part to uh, try to, you know, crack down, as you put it, on um, on um, overprescription of, of opioids, of, of the ease at which people were getting them, even the doctors that were prescribing them. And I, th and I think that the truth is that it, we, it had some impact. Um, we, we are better than we were in this department, but we have not, but we, we've had a counter result as well. We, that happens in public policy sometimes. You, you think you know what you need to do to address something and then uh, something else happens as a result uh, that maybe you didn't anticipate or you didn't get right. And what we've had um, in this particular case is 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 that uh, you know people with significant uh, pain, chronic pain, um, who have had incredible difficulty um, accessing uh, relief for that pain, have gone to other drugs um, and created epidemics there that are that are sometimes easier to get, sometimes more deadly. Some of the fentanyls and that kind of stuff. And so I, I think uh, I understand uh, what you're saying. And I, I think we are trying to get, get it right. I don't think, I don't think we can, you know, just go back to the, you know, status quo prior on, on, on opioids, because I think they were, they, they were too easy to get and, and people were getting on them way too fast. And as we now know uh, from, from, uh, you know, lawsuits and open admissions by some of the companies, they, they were trying to get people on, onto those drugs. And so there was a, pretty good business push to get that out there. But, you know, we, we lost sight of uh, people with chronic uh, pain suffering, and, and we certainly um, have, have had to deal with um, other results from it at this point. And so um, I, I, it'd be interesting to, to listen. I don't know if you're coming out of the B VA healthcare system on that comment or not, but, you know, sometimes the VA healthcare system actually is out front of the rest of the country <laughs> on some of this stuff. <laughs> Yes, this is um, because it does operate its own system. It's a huge system, um, and so uh, I'd be I'd be curious to know whether your comments are coming out of a VA specific medical yeah, yes. uh, experience or healthcare yes. experience. Yes, Matsunaga. Yes. I, okay, I've been treated. I've been treated uh, through the Palo the VA system for the last twenty five years in Palo Alto, and now in the last ten years here in Hawaii. Uh, out of Matsunaga, and what, what I'd like to make you aware of is, uh, are you getting feedback? Is, are, can you hear me? Um, I'm fine. Just Kira, just close close to his uh, close to him, so I can hear. Okay. I'm, that the pain physicians here. This is the last year I'm speaking about. Will try anything. And there are a lot of new, th new so-called therapies that I've been exposed to that I, the VA is paying a lot of money for. The magnetic belt that I was gi given for my back pain that uh, was, was over $1,200. And I let them know that um, it didn't work. But I'm left with all of these uh, magnetic cartridges and all of the paraphernalia that was sent to me. The same thing, I've gotten four different kinds of therapies, none of them as good as the, <laughs> the opioid-based uh, medication that I've been taking responsibly. And the, VA, the government is paying an enormous amount of money to try to not prescribe. So I, I'd really like you to look into all of okay. the, the alternatives that I don't think are very good alternatives. Yeah, um, I, I will look into it. First of all, I'm involved in it already because we have had those discussions uh, here in Congress, both generally and as you talk, um, I'm certainly recalling uh, hearings that we've had within the VA itself. Um, I will do that. But also, if you want us to look into it for you personally, um, uh, give, give a, you know, let us let my staff know and we can at least ask some of those questions. Uh, I don't really know why 
uh, I, I'm sure that there is a reluctance in the VA healthcare system, along with the rest of the system, to go to prescriptions of opioids right away. Um, and that's what I was talking about earlier. But if the other stuff isn't working, then obviously that leaves you in a very difficult situation. Thanks. Thank you, Cong Congressman. Uh, name's Rick Green, active duty 74 to 80 and inactive or, or active reserve for a few years after that. U.S. Navy, um, I, I wanted to touch on a couple of things real quickly that you already spoke about. The first one was on technology and VA, and the second one was uh, PACT Act. Uh, starting with the PACT Act, uh, there's a big, giant, gaping hole in the PACT Act right now related to jet fuel exposures. Uh, Congressman uh, from Virginia, uh, Spanberger, last year, she tried to get something done for us. Um, and I think it got sucked up into the PACT Act and it ended up that the VA just has to give a report within 12 months of passage. Of course, they haven't done that either, but um, that's, I guess, something else you could look into. Um, from the VA website, health effects may include irritation to unprotected skin, eye, upper rep respiratory, fatigue, breathing difficulty, headaches, dizziness, and sleep disturbances. I got them all. I submitted a claim. They're in my health records, denied, lack of service connection. So I'll be appealing. Uh, I don't need casework on that. I know what I'm going to do to fix that problem. My problem is all of these things are related to hundreds of thousands of veterans, flight line guys in the Air Force, people on carriers that, you know, they were exposed to the same con kind of chemicals that were in burn pits. Burn pits are fine, but I guess they're, they're much healthier if you get them at sea. It's crazy. Um, so that's something I, I feel needs a lot of attention. Secondly, technology at the VA. Um, their VA website uh, chatbot is horrible as far as trying to help a veteran to figure out how they need to pursue a claim. Um, and it's ridiculous. I created a website, I created a chatbot that is essentially an artificial intelligence VSO, and it will help guide a veteran all the way through the process, show them how to submit their claim, tell them what they need to do. The VA could do that for us. They should be doing that. They, by statute, they have to do that, but they're not doing it. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much on both counts. Um, we, I think I said it, we have unfinished business in the area of toxic, toxic substance exposure. And I'm sorry we didn't get the, the jet fuel covered uh, in the PACT Act. Um, that was a very difficult act to get passed. We did get it passed. I don't know uh, the kind of the inside story of why that uh, went from um, a, a, a covered um, situation to a report. I, I suspect it was um, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, effort to, to get the thing through Congress. Um, I'll go look at where that report is right now. If the report should have been submitted, it should be submitted. Um, I can definitely do that. I, uh, there, are, there, are, there are bills in Congress right now on some of them um, that would um, expand the PACT Act. And th this is one of those areas, as you point out, uh, there, there are gaping holes in it. Uh, we covered a lot of veterans with what we should have been doing. And it wasn't just the burn pits. Um, it was um, a number of other areas. So the very specific chemicals uh, in very specific areas. But that was the, the, the great, uh, a large number of our veterans that were exposed. But as you pointed out, I mean, there's whole areas that that are not covered um, um, yet. And so that's gonna be a years long um, effort. And I believe that people that were exposed should not have to go through extensive, you know, uh, proof of uh, service connection uh, process. So I hope you rethink the, the casework side of it. Um, sometimes we get a result that we don't expect. Uh, so um, please, please consider whether to use us on at least making your inquiry to see if we can establish service connection uh, uh, to start with, um, number one, number two, I'm not going to defend the VA's technology. I mean, I already talked about it, electronic health records. I already talked about, um, the, um, uh, the mission act, which has a lot of technological, um, aspects uh, to it. I have not been, um, 
I have not been on that website, at least recently that you talked about. You're, you're correct. I don't know why it's such a clunky website, especially in this day and age where you can can do a much uh, better one. So that's that's definitely worth an inquiry for me. So if you wanna give my staff or can give my staff the, the details, all I think we have it already. I think we just need to go uh, check out what you've re uh, referred me to and, and um, ask the question. I don't really know whether the VA is trying to improve it or not. I suspect they are because this has come up with uh, in hearings, um, but it is, it is a tough, big beast to get into the modern age, um, to be really blunt about it. Um, thank you again. Uh, thank you so much for your for your service. Uh, um, as we heard today, um, some of that service was very, very difficult and the consequences are, are long lasting, life lasting afterwards. And um, your country has a great debt to you, not only for your service, but uh, for the for the promises and obligations and undertakings we've made for you and your Ohana. And my challenge is to make sure we have those uh, programs correct, that they are fully funded and that they are actually um, helping you as best we can. Um, I definitely look forward to, to working with you on all of these areas. Again, uh, appreciate very much your time this morning and uh, for your country and for, your, uh, for all of the people that I represent um, in, in Hawaii. Uh, and for all of Hawaii, I think I can fairly say that um, as we come up on Veterans Day, uh, we're so deeply grateful again uh, that you served your country uh, and um, recognize our obligations uh, to you. So with that, uh, uh, mahalo and uh, have a great uh, rest of your weekend. And joining us now live here in the studio is Congressman Ed Case. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. Great to see you in person. Aloha. It's good to see you in person, too. I'm <laughs> glad to get out of Washington, D.C. for the week. You know, there is a, a lot of things that we want to get to, as we mentioned at the top of the show, of course, talking about some of the efforts that are happening on Maui and, and what you are doing specifically to help with some of the funding and, and just the recovery efforts. But we want to talk about some of the news that's breaking uh, about Red Hill and a uh, $1.2 billion claim that the Board of Water Supply uh, is citing with the Navy and some of the overall costs that it has cost the Board of Water Supply to deal with the issue of Red Hill. We know that you have been working on this issue for quite some time now. Your thoughts about overall, uh, not only this cost and, and this suit, but just how to navigate through this, knowing that this could be a price tag that continues to climb. Well, let's start with uh, some good news, um, which is that uh, Red Hill is well on its way to being defueled and to being closed. Uh, and that's that's a major accomplishment. We're now, now down to almost 100% of the fuel in the tanks uh, being drained out and disposed of somewhere else. Uh, We've got a couple more months to get to the harder to get to uh, fuel, uh, but uh, the bottom line is it is, it is almost empty now, uh, and um, we're on the process of closing it. Um, there are a whole bunch of issues that are go gonna go on for years, and we've said this all along. Uh, this is a years long process. Number one, actual damages to the, to the city, to the state, to others uh, from the consequences of, of the leaks. Um, number two, uh, tracking long-term healthcare. Uh, consequences, uh, which is something very topical. I was just uh, um, uh, talking with Senator Schatz about an in initiative that we have in Congress right now that we're trying to get passed for a long-term registry. Uh, and then, of course, um, uh, Ernie Lau did let us know yesterday, as a matter of courtesy, that he was filing this claim. Um, and let's face it, there are consequences that are in the billions of dollars that the Navy and the federal government need to take care of. And so whether that comes as a, as a result of a, of a judicial process, which is what he has initiated, or because of congressional action, which is what we've initiated, or any other way, um, we, we've got a ways to go still. Do you think that this was the appropriate mechanism to try to recoup some of those costs? Well, it was one of the mechanisms, and the Board of Water Supply was uh, legally under uh, time constraints to actually bring that claim. Uh, so they had to bring it or they were going to lose it. So I, I have no, no objections to them uh, pursuing it. Um, it does. It, it's not uh, technically a lawsuit yet. Uh, the process is, is under the Federal Tort Claims Act, um, is to file a claim. Um, the federal government, in this case, the Department of Defense, has six months to see if they can work it out. If they can't during that period of time, um, then um, an actual lawsuit is brought against the federal government by the Board of Water Supply. So the next six months is critical. Um, again, um, we have to pursue all alternatives uh, to be made whole uh, from this, uh, whether it be uh, the cost of new wells, which is primarily what this claim is about. Um, um, or tracking uh, whatever remaining um, leakage there is into the aquifer. And this has to be a long-term process to make sure that um, 
there are no long-term consequences. In those conversations that you've had thus far surrounding Red Hill over the last few years, uh, essentially, uh, what has been the climate or the pulse that you've gotten from some of your colleagues that maybe you've had to educate about this? Do they see this as an issue? And, and how much educating are you having to do to convince uh, your colleagues in Washington, D.C. of the importance of this uh, to really help continuing the funding and support that we've seen over the years? Um, we have done a lot of educating. I've brought colleagues out here personally. I've walked through Red Hill with them. Uh, these are our colleagues on my appropriations committee um, that has to fund all of these efforts. Uh, these are colleagues on the Armed Services Committee that has to authorize the actions of our federal government to defuel and close Red Hill. And so you, you bring every tool in your toolkit uh, to a large and critical um, issue like this. Um, in the very beginning, when this first broke, we were almost completed uh, for the fiscal year. And at that point, um, it was simply a matter of having relationships with colleagues that just took it on trust that the initial actions by the federal government to fund the recovery um, at a billion dollars plus needed to be in a, in a um, last minute bill that you don't get much in there. So that was, that was not about educating, that was just about them trusting that us when we said we really, really need this right now. After that, for the, for the midterm and long term, it was a little bit more educational, but um, I, you know, frankly, every colleague that came out here took the time to walk through Red Hill, took the time to understand what we were facing, took the time to, to, to um, reflect on uh, the fact that Red Hill is over our principal aquifer. I never had one that um, didn't understand at the end of the day that they needed to support us. So the support has been really rock solid, and it's been on both sides of the aisle, by the way. Um, so um, you gotta do that. I'm interested to learn more about this registry that you and the senator are working on. But before that, just so that I understand, I mean, whether it's through the actions that you're pursuing or the action now that Ernie Lau is pursuing, bottom line, do you think that the federal government, as opposed to the ratepayers here, should be covering this cost? I, I think the federal government should be covering the costs that are associated with the leakage, uh, period. And so, you know, the federal government shouldn't be covering costs that would have uh, come up anyway. Uh, but, but where we have significant um, uh, risks to the aquifer that um, were caused by the Navy, where we had to take um, action to address those risks, um, obviously exploratory wells. Um, Ernie wants to uh, drill uh, completely new wells uh, to, to assure the water supply and not be so at risk from, from any residual Red Hill uh, threat. He's right to do that. Um, that was caused by um, Red Hill, so yes. Where, the, where, the, where there's a cause and effect, uh, the federal government should be responsible. And, and let's get to that registry and, and hearing a little bit about that. Well, we, we know that um, there are, um, of course, healthcare consequences uh, to folks that were exposed to um, the leakage itself. So they, they drank it, in some cases they were simply exposed uh, to it other than drinking it. Um, what we don't know, uh, because it's really never been studied over the long term, is whether there are any long term um, effects. Um, now, uh, people that, uh, you know, were sick, some still think they are sick, but we're not talking about just one, two, three years. We're talking about five to ten years. Um, and so there's a necessity to try to track them over time because remember that these are largely military families. They're not going to be here. In fact, most of them that were exposed are not here anymore. They're off in some base somewhere else and, and or they're, they're out of the service. And so uh, what's critical for us, and this includes the civilians as well, because you know we move as well, um, what's critical is to develop a common registry um, that um, all people who felt that they might uh, have been exposed um, are tracked systematically over time. So we're talking five to 10 years. Uh, so if, if a, uh, or longer. So if a consequence shows up um, that maybe somebody forgot that it might have been Red Hill, they can say, oh, well, what about that? Maybe that was a cause. Maybe that is why we should uh, treat for uh, toxic uh, exposure. And so this is an initiative that Senator Schatz um, um, is, you know, he, he deserves the credit for getting it going. I'm, I'm his partner in the House. Uh, we're trying to get it passed. Uh, again, we want to encourage all of you who may be watching that have questions directly for Congressman Case. You can always put it into our Facebook comment section, or you can scan this QR code that you see at the bottom. Uh, enter your questions, and we'll try to get through and monitor them as they continue to come on in this discussion. Uh, you know, just last week we talked to Vice Admiral Wade about the future plans of Red Hill and this transition in, in leadership and overall what's happening there. Uh, you know, they discussed what the future of this facility looks like and the complete uh, shutdown and closure. They're still going out there and getting community uh, 
you know, responses and really trying to gauge what the community feels. Have you had any other conversations with constituents? Uh, what have you heard about what people generally think this facility, uh, what should become of this facility, or if anything should become of it? Well, I've had those conversations right from the beginning because, um, of course, in the beginning it was just a crisis. You had to respond to it, and then in the midterm you had to get the Department of Defense to understand that it needed to be defueled and closed. Uh, once we got past the kind of defueling and closing, then you know thoughts turned to, well, okay, if we're going to close it, what do we do with it next? I have studiously tried to stay very, very focused on the federal government's responsibilities uh, to, to um, you know, defuel and close and not really engage a whole bunch um, in, you know, what do we do with it next? I'm just trying to get through the steps of getting it defueled, um, getting the closure done, and then we can kind of take that on. I obviously have thoughts about it, and I obviously do hear from my constituents and others about what the next steps are. I think it's going to be a long process, first of all. So anybody that thinks that just because we close it, you know, we automatically convert over to some other, um, you know, use. No, that's not going to happen. I think the most likely outcome is that uh, once the closure occurs, it's just going to be mothballed for some, uh, sig you know, significant period of time while we figure out whether there is another use for it. My own view of it, frankly, is that there probably isn't another use for it, um, at least a practical use that can be, um, you know, implemented with um, not huge expenditures of money. So I think we're probably going to end up with the retire in place scenario. But this discussion has to continue. One of the other major discussions that's happening in our state is what's happened on Maui. Tell us a little bit about your efforts there. We know that there are so many people who are still hurting, especially when it comes to housing. Um, what kind of conversations have you been having just about federal aid to that community? Sure, well, that is very topical too because uh, we're right in the middle of an appropriations uh, cycle right now. Um, all of these amounts have to be funded. Uh, we are um, not in what we call regular order meeting, meaning that unfortunately because of uh, too much dysfunction and polarization in Congress, we're not kind of moving orderly in an orderly fashion through the appropriations process. Uh, we're in continuing resolutions, which are kind of like keep the funding where it is going forward. And so the money that we have needed, and, and I have been, you know, just like Red Hill, uh, everybody has their kuleana. Uh, and my kuleana together with the congressional delegation is, what are the federal government's responsibilities? What are the opportunities uh, for the federal government to help? And how do we fund those uh, responsibilities and opportunities? So, you know, um, there's lots of decisions to be made. Um, um, you know, what line it looks like um, in its next uh, chapters. Um, you know, um, how do you actually massage the housing codes on Maui to provide this kind of housing? You know, those are primarily at the state and the county level. So I, of course I'm involved in them, uh, but my focus is in Washington, D.C. on the feds. And since, since this incredible tragedy, there have been basically you know, three, three areas of effort. Um, you know, uh, number one, I would say just the sheer disaster uh, you know, recovery. Uh, so, the, so the reaction, the stabilization, the environmental cleanup, uh, you know, helping people with uh, through a very, very difficult time, identification of lost ones. Um, and uh, that is going along pretty well. Um, housing, we can come back to that because that is, to me, the number one challenge. Uh, and then finally, economic uh, regeneration, which is how do you help businesses that were lost? How do you help them to, to recover? What is, what is, the, La, the, what is the Lahaina, the, the West Maui economy look like in its next chapters? Because it's going through a real uh, change. We have worked, uh, first of all, primarily with the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management um, Agency, which is responsible for federal uh, disaster um, recovery relief um, every single day for the last uh, you know, 100 plus days at this point. Um, and um, they're our primary go-to agency. Um, so the first thing that we did, and we being our congressional delegation, uh, we funded $16 billion into a short-term spending bill uh, to replenish um, the disaster relief nationwide, knowing that um, a lot of that was going to be destined for Maui. That was number one. And so we got that done. So FEMA has the money uh, to proceed with what it needs to be doing, and it's got a broad range of um, efforts that it can pursue. On the housing, FEMA's got a real issue because, um, as we all know in spades, um, housing is not particularly available. But FEMA has uh, many options that it's pursuing. Um, it does want to get the 6,700 or so you know, folks that still are, are houseless um, out of those hotel rooms into, into intermediate housing. That's rental housing, um, 
that is in some cases, um, you know, actually, um, you know, renting an, an entire, you know, condo uh, building or housing project and then, you know, releasing it out to uh, the folks that, that need help. Uh, in some cases, it could include actually building uh, buildings um, and, um, and or buying buildings to be dedicated uh, to taking care of housing recovery. So it's a, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's a real, um, it's a real problem. It's a real issue. Um, it involves all of the federal government, the state government, the local government, the community to get this done uh, right. It's not going to be easy. Um, the real crunch time is coming uh, where people really need to be moving out of that transitional into more permanent uh, housing. The feds have a piece of that, and that's what I'm trying to help with. The final is economic uh, recovery, uh, which is going to, which is a, a tougher nut. Uh, because many of the federal programs um, don't exactly match what we need. So think about what we did during COVID, some of those programs, you know, that helped out small businesses. Um, a lot of the times, uh, those don't really apply anymore because those small businesses are gone. They have no assets. They have, they have nothing to loan against. They don't want to borrow any more money. And so can we fashion better federal programs or fund programs that are a little bit more arcane, not particularly used? Can, can we mix and match and mold to what Lahaina actually needs from an economic recovery? Um, this is an area that I think ultimately um, the, the feds can take uh, pr pretty good care of uh, disaster recovery, debris removal. Um, they can take pretty good care with partners of housing. The economic side is a little tougher and that's where I think we're going to need a lot more um, step, par step up participation by the state, by the county, by some of um, the, 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 the NGOs and nonprofits who, who you know, have, have a significant amount of resources to help out. One, two, three. Do two, uh, do another one after the, after this one, or another one, just in case. <laughs> I could do it if I was here also, just if I oh, know, yeah, skipping be between things. That's probably a better way to do it. That's yeah. that's a good idea. If not, I try to send my staff about once every four months or something like that. Well, we don't want to see Nestor. <laughs> Evans, I, mean, I, mean, you know, I haven't seen him for a long time. His wife and I work together at the oh, really? uh, uh, Catholic Charity. Nestor is the guy taking the pictures right now. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just talking to my camp, my uh, my show. This yeah. is my. Uh, so what are the what are the neighborhood board's number one issues? Your neighborhood board. What do you guys worry about? Well, most? the biggest issue would be monster homes. And so we've been take, taking the actually the city to task, and I'm, they're really cracking down. Now. They're prohibiting or actually stopping those permits, knowing that they don't, you know, they're not legitimate. And, but, we're, you know, we've got a lot of them already built, so right. what do we do with them? Right. The city's not going to tear them down. No, they're not ordering them thus no, far. No, no. They're no. finding them, but, you know, people can just make so much money if they skirt the rules and oh. put in a monster home. It's worth the fine to them. Oh, yeah, and that's why, you know, I think now they have to have a little more teeth in regard to the laws. Right, right. And, you know, so what they do, they, they tell them to give them a stop order, they stop, but they're supposed to stop, but they keep on going. And then they appeal. Now, this, is, this is an administrative appeal. How long does that take? Right. Then if you lose that, you go to the courts. And how long does no, that take? No, no stay of the construction. So then they get all the way through the process, and they kind of dare the court to order them to tear it down. You got it. Come on. You want me to tear this down? Come on. <laughs> Come on. Well, I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I do believe that um, our, our zoning laws should be enforced. and. It is very little that I have to do with that at the federal level, but we can certainly chime in. I think the other the other problem we had, I don't know why, is that there was proliferation of illegal gambling houses, especially in the Lily Hill area. Really? I was a little despondent because nobody told me I'm it me going to Las Vegas, but you know, I know that Tyler has yeah. introduced a couple of legislations, yeah. but again, how much teeth does it have? Yeah. To me, if you find the, the owner that's having illegal gaming house, Confiscate well, property. it shouldn't be that way. I mean, if you if you commit federal crimes on private property, there's a right of forfeiture yes. to the feds. Yes. I actually don't know. Like, if you do a federal drug crime, 
Yes. On property, yeah, that's you know, you, you're subject to having your property forfeited to yes. the federal government. They did that on the Chinatown. I remember one of the bars. Yeah. Was saying, I don't know Go. why it's not the case. I thought it actually was the case at the state level, to be honest. But well, you know, whatever help the yeah. feds can do, or give them, you know, some pointers, quote yeah. unquote. Okay. I think would help. I'm going to go talk to uh, Tyler about that. Yeah, do that. I think. Okay. We can. Hey. Well, it's great thanks, to see you, and nice thanks for uh, having me here. Not at all. <laughs> you have some good people. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Sai, good to see you. Yeah, we're to Washington, D.C. We're almost going to call you. <laughs> You're coming? We were. We were. Yeah. Oh, how come you didn't call me? Yeah. I don't know. Who's the travel agent? <laughs> you got a bad travel agent. <laughs> Uh, me. <laughs> I mean, you, you can come to my office for free. We give you stuff. We give you a tour of the Capitol yeah, we, we went for to, free. We, we contacted Hirono's office. Oh, Hirono. Well, yeah. yeah. If you just get just as long as you get one of yeah, us. Yeah, we did. You know, even though mine is the best. I was disappointed she wasn't there. Though. <laughs> we didn't know she wasn't going to be there. Oh, uh, yeah. We were there. Yeah, but did they get you a tour and everything? Yeah, yeah we that's good. Though. Yeah, you know, a lot of times people don't know about it. They and then I, it's like this. Well, it, at least you guys knew that you could go to your yeah. member of Congress for that. But a lot of times people don't know. They come up to D.C. and then they after afterwards I talk to them. I said, "Why didn't you call me?" And then I think to myself, "Well, it's not really their fault." You know, I mean, I just didn't get the word out that that's one of the things that we do for people that are visiting. I enjoy it. You know, if, if I'm around, I'll meet with people and. Talk story. Sometimes I'll give the tour myself. Oh, really? Yeah, I just oh. gave it um, like 10 days ago. I gave a tour. Oh, okay. Yeah, just because I had some free time and yeah. it was a first. Next time you go watch it. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, mainly tell your friends. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Tell, tell the people that come to DC okay. to come visit us. Yeah. You make it a personal tour. Yeah. Yeah. The price. The price is right. Oh. <laughs> It's a benefit. <laughs> we love Washington, D.C. Yeah. We'll go it's a nice, it's a nice city. So much to see, so much to do. It's yeah, it's kind of, have you been to D.C.? Huh? Washington, D.C., have you been? Yeah. Ooh. I like the history, the legacy, it's so Yeah. Awesome. You, you just too far to go or too busy or? Too busy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he's gone a lot, so. Yeah. yeah. He's gone a lot from work. Yeah. I especially like to watch for the people that have never been to DC before. Like, a fair number of people have been there, and but the first timers, those are the ones you want to get them right away to. Did you see him? The first time we went, we were at the mall. He had us go here, there, everywhere. <laughs> So in my family, I'm him, and you are my wife. <laughs> I'm the travel agent. But if I if I do too much, well, first of all, there's certain things I have to do in a certain order to make it work. You know, like I want to get to the hotel, drop the bags, and split, and just start powering in. She doesn't want that. She wants to get to the hotel, settle in, you know, settle down, um, get supplies, and then and then hit the road. Then if I like fill up the day a little too much, um, and especially if I don't do the things she likes to do, you know, I'm in trouble. So yeah, I'm, I'm always on the edge as a travel agent. Yeah, we still have to see the pandas before they left. Oh yeah, we got to see the pandas. They were actually out in the cage and yeah. on the lawn. Oh, well, that's good. Nice. Yeah, because yeah, we didn't nice get to the first time, so like we didn't ah. see it. So I don't know if I ever did see the pandas yeah. in Washington. That's pretty cool. That's the thing about. Everybody thinks, oh, wow, you must really enjoy Washington, D.C. I mean, I don't do anything in D.C. I just go there. I, I'm only on Capitol Hill, yeah. the only place I really go. I don't go to the museums and, you know, to the restaurants. Like, you ask me what, what are the good restaurants, I tell you. Talk to my staff. They're the ones that know, <laughs> know where, the, where the good restaurants are. Okay, nice to see you. Oh, if any, some of these kids, they look pretty young. Yeah. How, 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 how young do you start them? Like uh, four or five? Five. Five. Yeah. Five. Yeah. five they can get going already. Yeah, um, actually my son starts at like six. Six. And then now he's about 16. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so now he's leading it? 
Uh, yeah, some of the routines is leaving, mm -hmm. leaving the routines. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. All right, we're gonna yeah. get this out and more people interested in oh, this yeah. uh, culture yeah. event and yeah. society. No, it's a great one. Yeah. You got so many people in here. Oh yeah, well okay. thank you so all much. Right, right. Okay. Have a nice okay. happy holiday. You got, you're ready to go, huh? Are these, are these, uh, I mean, special wood or what? What are those? Uh, this is, this one is rosewood. Rosewood, so it's hard. Yeah, it's more dense. Really hard. Yeah, it has a good weight to it. Uh-huh. Can, can I try it? This one versus... Oh, it's pretty heavy, actually. Yeah, this one's a lighter one. So is that, is that, um, so... So the tone Does a weight sound, make it oh, yeah, makes, makes a different tone? So it depends on what your routine is. Yeah. So this is a lighter pair. Oh wow! Significantly. That's a really uh, that's quite a difference. <laughs> and so this one is kind of a little deeper and more yeah, yeah, resonant or whatever, yeah, and this one is a little higher. Yeah, yeah. but it really depends on the, the user. Who, oh, I see. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right, I learned something every day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, wow. Yeah, so, uh, oh, wow. we're still kicking. A lot of them are, you know, moving. But yeah, yeah. We what still kind, have uh, incoming. Like, do you have a particular uh, constituency that, that you oh, serve? Oh, majority <laughs> Filipino. Oh, really? Filipino. Oh, yeah, I know, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's yes. like old time, yeah? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And then we're um, getting a large community uh, of Micronesians, so they've been very helpful as well. They live in, they live in the area? In the area, yes. So we're very happy to have them as well. <laughs> How many in the school? In the school, our enrollment is still a little rocky, but we're at about 209, 209. That's pretty big. No, yeah. Yeah, a little bit more. For what grade? <laughs> uh, we have a preschool all the way to 8th grade. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. All right. Okay. I get a hey, profile. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas, guy. Okay. You're in the front, Merry yeah? You got a... Or I'm the last guy. Oh, you're the last guy. I know where I am. You guys are up front. You guys... <laughs> Merry Christmas. All right, you too. Have a good one. All right, one. hey, take care of it. Okay, now this is a this is a video right here. Hello. Hello. So, uh, how long have you been uh, Miss Hawaii Chinese? Miss Hawaii Chinese. We just had our coronation dinner this uh -huh. past uh, month, and so we're gonna be the new court for 2024. So uh -huh. we're looking forward to serving the community, making some good positive impacts, uh -huh. and just having a great time overall. Um, how many uh, contestants were there? We actually had. Um, usually, it ranges from like five to like 10, 15. It just uh -huh. depends on the year. Yeah. And then this year, our court we have five girls, two uh, queens, and three princesses, oh. and so you'll be seeing them further along the line. Oh, really? The so this is the lineup of the of the, uh, the queens and princesses there? So we have our um, Miss Chinatown Queen, Sarah, she's in the yeah. yellow part, and we have our first princess, Connie Hall. Uh -huh. We have Ellie, who is our um, Miss Chinatown princess, and me, Miss Holy Chinese. Wow, you went very late when you here. So how did, how did you uh, get into this? How did you decide to uh, be a contestant? Personally? So what do you attribute your success? I would say that the reason why I kind of even participated, it was my first pageant ever, I never had any experience before. I wanted to be able to have a platform to kind of connect with community leaders, because in the future I want to serve as a primary career position. And so that's why I basically wanted to talk to you. Are you in university now, or what are you? I'll be starting medical school next week. Oh, you're, you're like well on your way. Huh? I, I sure hope so. Oh, that's really? the, the goal is to serve Hawaii's community.
Thank you. 